Hello everybody and welcome to a detailed diatribe where today I am joined by Red to talk about, wildly enough, the 10th anniversary of Overly Sarcastic Productions. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> Time is relentless and moves ever forward yeah. at a rate of approximately one year per year, but that's still kind of too fast. Uh, it is not exactly the 10th anniversary yet. First video on the channel was December 18th of 2012, but we're close enough. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, we're doing like a little retrospective. It's okay to do that a little early, you know? It's to yeah, get ahead exactly. of the curve. It's been a lot. It's been a lot. I mean, like, I, I started this like mid high school. We've been through all of college, the tumultuous post-college years, uh, and now here we are in the prime of our youths, uh, <laughs> making money in a way that 20 years ago would have been completely incomprehensible. It has been a while uh, since, since OSP began. Red's first video was quite a ways back, yeah. as mentioned, and my first video on the channel was not exactly a recent occurrence either, um, even though it was, um, you know, three years later, uh, two and a bit. It, it was still a long, long, long time ago in the merry days of, of 2015. Mm. What we are not about to do is rehash the entire history of the channel point by point. <laughs> you can do that yourself by watching through every one of our videos, live streams, and podcasts oh, in order, and God. you'll get the picture. But what we're going to do instead <laughs> is talk about what we've learned and take kind of a, a more top-down analytical perspective, sort of a, an OSP summarized rather oh, than a, a, a strenuous <laughs> and specific recounting, uh, if you will. Yeah, that, that so, seems on brand for us. Yeah. Um, fun fact, the video of the Athenian Empire is unlisted. I'll explain why oh, later. Oh, is it in the uh, Bad History playlist? <laughs> it's in the Bad History playlist, uh, yeah. Ain't that okay. just the way. Done messed up, eh, Athens? Mm. Um, so, <laughs> we present 10 lessons from 10 years of working on this channel. We'll go through one at a time, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have learned a thing or two by the end of yeah, it. Yeah, we'll chat. Yeah, we'll how's discuss. that sound? We'll, we'll have a grand old time. It'll be fantastic. Awesome. So, Red, you're going to be leading us through a lot of the beginning parts of this, even though it is my slide, so I'll kind of, like, <laughs> tee you up, and then we can go through. Fantastic. Uh, the first year, year zero, December 2012, was beginning the Shakespeare era, where uh, Red made a video for a class project. Well, the thing that clicked when I when I set up to make the very first video on this channel is that, as a person who has spent very much of my life extremely bored, any story can be interesting if you find the right way to tell it. The event that precipitated the creation of the Much Ado About Nothing Shakespeare Summarized was I was reading Much Ado About Nothing in class. We were having a, a grand old time talking about all the love complications and the, the really boring villains. And, and I was at dinner with my family and family friends, and they were like, so what are you up to at school? And I was like, oh, God, it's, uh, it's so boring. We're reading much do about nothing and they're like oh what's the deal with that and i was like god well there's this and there's this lady hero and, <laughs> and this guy and they're so boring and somehow the play's about them and not about beatrice and benedict who are much more interesting and then like i i kind of went off on this whole tirade and by the time i was done everybody was laughing and i was like I've got something here. So after dinner, I like wrote down as much of that rant as I could remember. <laughs> and then later, uh, like in the class, our teacher was like, now you, I want you to do an art project of some kind about what are the plays we've covered. And I was like, you know what counts as an art? <laughs> a video essay, and I already have a script. <laughs> I like entertaining people. It's something that I very much enjoy. Perhaps you could guess that from all of my everything. Uh, but it, it's difficult to find a way to sometimes, especially when so much of what you deal with is is so tiring or unpleasant or, or stressful. But this is sort of the first time it clicked to me, like what exactly it is that entertainers and comedians are doing, especially when they're doing things like observational comedy. That's literally just, you take a thing that happened and then you find the way to tell it that makes it fun. And as soon as that was a thing that I realized I wanted to get better at doing, that sort of precipitated this whole thing. So I, I think that covers year yeah. zero pretty well. <laughs> pretty, pretty squarely. I, I, I think the, uh, the, the moral of, of the story is essentially when you find yourself having this moment of inspiration, whether it's a funny you know, conversation at a family dinner, just you have the opportunity to, to try for something, just give it a shot. Even if it doesn't work, it's just, just try it. If something strikes you and that like stirs like a little, you know, the gears start clicking in your head, like that was actually really cool. Just follow it see where it leads and just just start because if you don't start no, nothing else is ever going to happen it all has to start somewhere so if if you think you want to try something just 
just go for it. Yeah. This takes us to year two. Uh, or year one. Sorry, year that one. was year zero. We're, we're indexing <laughs> one, this like you do in computer science, where you start at zero and then increment from there. Anyway, yes, uh, year one, 2013, the lean year. Uh, this was because I was in school. I had only done one video yet. Uh, I wasn't sure this was going to be a thing. I think, like, Tens of people had followed the channel at that point. Uh, I, it was definitely still called Red Eyes Take Warning after my favorite TV trope at the time, which I was also getting <laughs> supremely into. Uh, and I think I made only two videos, uh, Hamlet and Julius yep. Caesar, because they were also things that they were either things we were doing in class or they were things where I was like, what are the interesting Shakespeare plays? I know. Uh, <laughs> and, and even that, I don't think it could have been that because Julius Caesar wouldn't have been on my top three. <laughs> now, what I learned with this is that... Uh, th it's weird thinking back on this because I was, like, 10 years ago, I was 16. You know, nine years ago, I was 17. And, like, that's that's on the cusp of adulthood, you know. Uh, in a year's time, I'll be a woman, dark place reference. But, like, at the... <laughs> I saw the pain. I saw the pain on your face on that one. Yeah, um, I think the audience will hear it, too. <laughs> <laughs> I made them watch the pilot. They didn't like it very much, but that's okay. Uh, I'll always have dark place. Anyway, um, at the time, I hadn't really done anything that I had stuck with, that I had that I had created that I felt mattered. And I remember not liking that very much. Like, I'd filled sketchbooks, but I didn't like any of them particularly much. I'd done stuff in art class that, it w that was in my portfolio for uh, getting into college, but like, I, I hadn't started the comic. I mean, I've been working on the comic, but I hadn't drawn anything that I could show anybody that I was happy with. Um, I'd written stuff for my own enjoyment, but it wasn't anywhere yet. And I basically just made one video that was an experiment that was half vocal performance practice. Uh, and I remember just feeling very like, oh, I can't stick with anything, you know? I, I pick things up and then I, I get bored and I drop them and I just can't commit. And I think what I learned this year is that that's not actually how art works, uh, because anything you put down you can pick up again. It doesn't It doesn't become like tainted or corrupted just because you stop working on it. But if you do fall into that headspace of like, oh, this is a failing on my part, I can't commit, that's gonna build up a wall of really bad feelings around this thing that you might otherwise yeah. completely enjoy picking up and working more on. And I think just kind of learning that you can put a project down and pick it back up again later or even not pick it back up later. And that doesn't mean you are failing as a creator. It doesn't mean that you can't create things because what you've created up until that point will still exist and still matter. And this was very important because at the same time, uh, not to completely sidetrack into the comic, but I was working on these at the same time at, at, on roughly the same level of like, this is gonna be a thing maybe someday, but like who the <laughs> fuck knows. I had a timeline file that I'd been working on that had gotten so huge and unwieldy I couldn't bear to look at it. And I had to kind of be like, I don't actually know if this is ever going to happen, you know? And that, that wouldn't be the end of the world. This is the first big writing project I've ever done. You know, I've heard from other artists that like usually the first thing you make is bad and, and, and sometimes it crashes and burns. So I'll just put this down and work on something else. And I put it down and I left it alone for a full year. And then I caught myself trying to insert high fantasy elements into the urban fantasy thing I was working on. I was like, wait a minute. What can that mean? <laughs> and I picked it back <laughs> up and it was much easier. I scrapped the timeline file, rewrote the parts I remembered from memory. It was so much easier after that point. So the the lessons yeah. I learned this year of like, you can be slow and, and methodical and you can even be like, I can't do this right now. And you can leave it alone and maybe never pick it back up. But if you do pick it back up, that'll be great. Cause then you'll, yeah. it'll still be there. <laughs> And then this, after the process of picking it back up, leads us into year two, 2014, <laughs> the return of the Bard, which was a banger year for your videos. You've got four through 11 in the Shakespeare Summarized playlist. Oh, That's, yeah. I can count, uh, like seven videos. That was some real iteration on a theme, taking what was, you know, some scattered videos that were loosely related and really turning it into a full style and an identity for this project of yours mm. that I only really kind of caught wind to a little bit later. I knew you were doing this in high school. We were like hanging out every day and I was like, oh, this is a thing that Red does. And only in college, I'm like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> Yo, I remember the day I texted you like, this is, this is th like, I found this. What the, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, it so, was Red, talk about the, the process of, of iterating through multiple videos now that you were really kind of in it and, and hitting your stride on the Shakespeare stuff. Yeah, I, I sort of picked up speed. Uh, the channel was growing in 
attention, but it wasn't anywhere near what I would consider like even the the beginnings of what it is now. Uh, it, yeah, you know, I, I think there were a few hundred people at this point. It was um, it was becoming a thing that I was basically doing for my own enjoyment and to prove to myself that I could. Because as mentioned, you know, it, you can pick, you can put something down and pick it back up. But if you keep dropping things, it can start to feel a little bit like disheartening. I wanted to know that I could stick with a long form project even through the parts that were getting maybe tedious. Because you know that. That sort of let me build up the tool set I needed to be able to stick with a project through the hard parts. Uh, because every art project, like you're gonna start off with a big fun idea that you really wanna make work, and then you are going to hit walls. And if you, yeah. if you can't keep going through those, then the project isn't actually going to happen. And I, I really wanted to make a lot of the things that I was thinking about happen. I needed to know that I could do that. Uh, also, this gave me a way to get through literature that I thought it was just a good idea to have read. You know, Shakespeare is kind of foundational. <laughs> I was yeah. interested in writing, but I had been so bored trying to get through them before. It's tough if you don't have the the lens to, to read it, or if your teachers are so cruel that they never show you a performance of it. Yeah. It is, you know, it's such good literature, and we go on record all the time of, like, Shakespeare is so good, you guys, but if you don't know what you're looking for it's hard to get into it, it is. it's really hard yeah and like I, I I you know I'd read these I think my my dad had probably read some of them to me when I was younger because that's you know the kind of household I grew up in uh like we had all the plays just in the bookshelf you know on the first floor and I was just kind of like I wish I could understand why people like these and then I had this approach you know part of the reason that I I enjoyed doing this so much is that I could click into a story that would otherwise be a little too arcane and complicated for me by just being like, how would I retell this in an actually fun way? <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, Bard, let's let's see an actual artist take this on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Shakespeare was writing for an audience that wasn't me because I wasn't born yet yeah. and wouldn't be for like 400 years. But, you know, it, it's it's just an interesting thing that I suddenly had this way to to attack things that were much too big and, and complicated and annoying before because it was like, if I'm retelling this, I need to understand what's happening. I can't just, yeah. you know, scroll through the Wikipedia summary. I can't check the spark notes. I got to actually know because the parts that don't make it into the summaries are the parts where the weird funny stuff is. <laughs> like, yeah. they aren't yeah. going to mention the weird little punchline or the thing that I could turn into like a Metal Gear reference or whatever. Like, that's not going to make it onto spark notes, but it's in the play. And... If you're approaching it from that from that perspective, like you you'll find a bunch of weird weird stuff that you can frame in interesting ways. Over the course of this, when I started just making more of them, just as an actual thing, I, the upload schedule was not at all uh, regular. I mean, you know, that's like seven years to get there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's eight videos in a whole year. That's not every Friday. That's not even every other Friday. That's when it was done. I would put it on YouTube. Um, yeah. I was still using movie footage uh, because that was easy and there were a ton of movie versions of all the Shakespeare plays, even if a lot of them weren't very good. Uh, <laughs> sorry, no offense to Kenneth Branagh, but like a lot of those Shakespeare movies are people <laughs> like really trying to be like, I'm a serious director, I'm so cool. Uh, look at me doing something that nobody's ever done before. And it's like, yeah, you're doing Shakespeare. <laughs> it works because everybody's done it before. And let's see, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. I, of course I would have done that one early. That's one of my favorite plays. Uh, went through the big names, Macbeth, from and Juliet, Tempest. Uh, and then I started getting into the ones that were a little bit shakier. King Lear, is, uh, it's just a bad time for everybody. The Merchant of Venice <laughs> has the raging anti-Semitism problem. But like, other than that, you know, it, it, I was getting out of the zone of, yeah, these are the plays that like you're expected to know about and into the like, this is kind of weird. This is kind of interesting. But also we were creeping up on the end of high school. You know, we were doing a lot of college prep. I think we'd done all of our applications at this point. So this year was basically when things... <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, but like I was I was picking up speed on just doing these Shakespeare summarized because I was having a great time. I was, you know, enjoying the work and the practice and feeling myself getting better at, at recording my, my voice, which was a thing that I was just interested in doing overall. Um, and then we were sort of 
skating up on the edge of, hey, we're all about to graduate and go our separate ways and, you know, hit up colleges scattered all across the country. And who knows what that's going to look like? Yeah. So somewhere along the line, I actually put up a video that's now long since unlisted that was basically, hey, guys, there's like 300 of you. I'm about to graduate high school and go to college. I have no idea if I can keep this up. So this might be the end. But, you know, (laughs) it's been a very little did they know. Well, I didn't know. (laughs) Um, I know. Exactly. Yeah. But I had this this tool now. I had this way to approach literature that I maybe couldn't just get through by just reading it straight. And I thought that would be very useful going into college. So lesson-wise, it was partially that, you know, getting better and better was a matter of basically being like, this part of the project is good enough. If I kept polishing it forever, it would yeah. never go out. It's more important, like it, like yep. done is better than perfect. But also it was like, I, I could like feel myself getting better at literary analysis and unpacking stories because I wasn't just hitting this wall of just like zero dopamine and just sliding <laughs> down it cartoonishly. Because yeah. I, I found a way to, to trick my brain into finding it interesting by treating it like raw materials that I could use in retelling or, or comedy or art. So uh, it was just it was just good. And considering yeah. the stuff I had to do in college, that was like a very good tool set to have. <laughs> yeah, I, I think on the subject of, of done is better than perfect, what I've said in a couple places and I, I didn't put exactly on the slides is Hank Green has an 80% rule, which mm. is get something to what you would say is 80% of the way to perfect, ship it, finish it, start the next thing. Doing <laughs> 80% of a project to perfection twice is a lot better than agonizing over that last 20% of the first project, getting frustrated, never finishing it, and then quitting. Yeah. So, you know, that iteration of like, get it to 80%, get it to almost perfect, get it to really good, and then be like, okay, this is done, next, let's go again. Try it, iterate fast, and build up those skills, working on different plays, different stories, where you will develop that ability to analyze and and internalize a story and then spit out a sarcastic (laughs) presentation of it. You will get better at that a lot, faster if you iterate rather than laboring forever on on a single one yeah just like with the benefit of hindsight like i would not call any of these videos good uh (laughs) but like with the benefit of hindsight like at the time i couldn't have made them much better than they were like now (laughs) the things i could do with shakespeare oh man but like at the time, you know, I was, I hadn't had the experience that I have had now. My my perfect at the time wouldn't even be what I consider now to be good. Yeah. I just, you know, I only got to where I am by accepting the, the 80% rule over and over again. And every time I'd learn something new, but I also learned something similar doing the comic because I did as much pre-prep as I could possibly do to teach myself all the art I felt I needed. And then as soon as I started actually drawing the pages, things popped up that I hadn't thought about. Like, oh yeah, I can draw the human figures, but like forested backgrounds are an absolute, what am I gonna do? And then, you know, you you, you find shortcuts, you find ch- tricks that work, little things that help to add depth to a background, uh, little posing tricks that make things feel more dynamic. And you can't prep for that before you start the project because you can't know the problems that are going to arise. The things I learned in these first few years of just kind of like fooling around, messing around, keeping the stakes low in my head, reminding myself that it didn't have to be perfect because I was using it to learn, that was all I really needed. And as a result, it built up to the level that I could eventually start producing things that I now would consider pretty good. So this is where we ship off to college and then we start pivoting during what is essentially the big year of Greek stuff. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) A way to think about it is that taking a risk on something that you don't know how to do is a good way to throw yourself into the water and learn. So 2015 saw Red and us and OSP pivot in three major ways. One was going from Shakespeare plays to Greek plays to Greek myths. Mm -hmm. Second one was going from movie footage to animation as a result of the movie Troy being unusable uh, for an adaptation of the Iliad because they end up changing so much weird stuff. And of course, the third one was going from one creator to two creators, which is a pretty big, uh, a pretty big jump. All of these at once would have been way too much to to do going from Shakespeare videos to, oh, here's a guy doing history now. Mm. What? But small lateral pivots over the course of a larger span of time going one by one by one is substantially simpler and more straightforward and easier to manage as a creator when you are also dealing with, say, freshman year of college. Yeah. So 2015 was probably 
the most transformative year of the channel because it's when I showed up. It's when we started branching out in terms of what we can do for, for topics because it's not just Shakespeare. You, you said, Red, mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do... Greek plays, let's do Oedipus, let's do Iphigenia, let's, okay, let's let's do something else. Let's do the Iliad, because yeah. you were doing a, a Greek thought and lit class, That's exactly I think it was. It. Yeah, uh, I, one of my classics classes, even though I was a math major, I needed to do a bunch of, like, literature and, and writing and stuff. Uh, and Greek thought and lit was the class that my dad had taken, and I thought it would be fun to do that approach. Uh, and that meant we were just reading so many Greek plays and kind of culminating in the Iliad. And I already had this method of approach to, to get through things that I thought were too complicated. And most of the plays were honestly pretty chill. So, like, summarizing them for funsies was mostly just because it was like, I mean, it's Oedipus Rex. Like, all the jokes write themselves. <laughs> uh, but with the Iliad, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to need to do this. And then I hit the f boat list and I was like, oh, I desperately need to do this. Like, I was taking <laughs> notes on the story so that I could <laughs> post later. <laughs> and as a result, I knew what happened in the book. And I actually, I have a second uh, secret lesson, which is, uh, it's correlated with you joining the channel. Because I, I don't remember if I've mentioned this. Uh, I was really, really nervous <laughs> about you joining the channel. I mean, yeah, you should have been. I was bad. Well, I mean, I was bad too. But like when you first reached out, because uh, I, I don't really know how to explain this in a way that doesn't sound kind of very sad. But like when we all split off after high school and went to different colleges, there was a degree to which I was like, I have... I've had this happen before, you know, I've moved schools before, uh, and people who were incredibly close just sort of drift apart, and it, it's just a thing that happens, and it, it's sad, but, you know, there's not really a whole lot you can do. Like, if both people want to keep the connection, you can keep the connection, but if only one person wants to keep the connection, it's not gonna work, and, like, I, I really liked everybody I'd gotten to know in high school, and I thought it was great, but, like, very few of them were going to the school I was going to, and I was just kind of worried that things were gonna sort of slow down and cool off and all that jazz. Uh, and I was sort of like resigning myself to it <laughs> as I was working my way through the beginning of college. And then you like ping me out of the blue on uh, like the Facebook Messenger account that I had had for like two months total at that point. Uh, <laughs> and you were like, oh my God, I just found your channel. This is so fun. And I was like, oh, sh hello, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and I was like, oh my God, this is actually really fun. But at the same time, I was like, I don't, you know, I. I don't know, I can think of all the ways this could go horribly wrong. Because because um, cause we were initially just like, oh yeah, this is really fun. And then you were like, hey, I have this really fun idea. Like I just had a lecture on like Athenian history that really hit and I, I would love to make a video about that. And I was like, oh, because at the same time, like I, I was so <laughs> thrilled that you reached back out and I was like, yes, connections, friendship, this yeah. is incredible. But also I was like, this is like my thing. This is the this one is thing I've made so far <laughs> that's like actually really, solidly working, that people have eyes on, that they're enjoying, even if it's only like 300 people, that's still a, more of an artistic impact than I've had at any point. Because I had like no online presence before this. So I, I didn't have like online fan communities. I didn't have like a deviant art or fan art or anything like that. I'd never actually had people on the internet be like, hey, this thing you made is good. So this was like all very new. And I had gotten just attached to it enough that when you were like, I'd love to add something to it. I was like, ooh. I, I don't know, but I yeah. also don't have a good enough reason to say <laughs> no. Uh, so I kind of, <laughs> well, I, what I ended up doing was I was like, you know what? Screw it. You know, I like him. I trust him. I'm curious to see what he has to say. And absolute worst comes to worst. People just don't watch it. Like that, that's a very low stake. Uh, <laughs> and, um. So I was like, yeah, yeah, let's freaking do it, man. Uh, <laughs> and you put up the video. So basically the, the lesson that I learned is that like, if you are feeling isolated and if you're if you're worried about protecting the things that you have the solution to that is not actually like put up all the walls guard it like a dragon's horde the solution is to take risks uh and <laughs> to trust people because it might go wrong but it might go really really right and uh i have absolutely no regrets about the partnership we formed over the last 10 years and i'm absolutely thrilled at how well we've managed to maintain the friendships we had yeah. for so long and and all the people we care about and i i think if i'd if i'd given into that little like just stay in the box instinct uh i would not be as happy of a person as i am uh and Aww. the channel wouldn't be as good so <laughs> Oh, thanks. Yeah. I, cause I, I felt so confident in reaching out because I had been 
chatting with you a little bit after we first like kind of reconnected over the Shakespeare stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you were working on the the Iliad and then the Odyssey video, and I was like, oh, I'm reading this in class. Like, happy to help. Like, you know, like check over like art and like suggest little yep. doodles and stuff, and you know, talk through the thing. And then it was specifically when you were working on the Inferno video that I was also doing for for class. We were reading that, and I was yeah. like, oh, I, I'm so helpful, <laughs> uh, guy in the chair kind of feeling. Yeah. And then when I got this one uh, lecture on Greek history, I'm like, uh, yes, my artistic calling. Like, <laughs> I had an Assassin's Creed podcast at this point. I was writing weekly philosophical Facebook posts. I was the hottest shit in my head. <laughs> and I thought I could do absolutely no wrong. No, I mean... <laughs> so you... I was like, of course, this will be perfect. I actually, I think I remember the, the tipping point conversation because I was like two months into doing illustrations of Dante's Inferno. And I was like, I might be in over my head. This is so <laughs> annoying and hard. There's so much happening happening and you were like well you know if you if you want something on the channel while you're still working on this <laughs> i have an idea and i was like <gasps> and we did plan it as a one-off we only planned it to be a one-off thing yeah. like just what to tide your audience over until the inferno we'll get back to the regularly scheduled classic summarized yeah so, i mean we were uh, yeah. we were we were playing with so many different ideas at the time like part of what helped with the channel like I like kind of giving myself rules and parameters to operate within. So it was like, we're doing Shakespeare. And then it's like, we're branching out a little bit into Greek myths and like uh, classics and the stuff I'm covering in class, like, which is good because I was running out of Shakespeare and I didn't really want to do all the <laughs> historical plays. Uh, and then, uh, then it was like, hey, history. I was like, yeah, history. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. it was, so part of the reason the channel is structured the way it is with basically a whole bunch of like, clearly partitioned like obviously the line between a myth and a folktale and a legend might be a little bit shaky but like the those videos are separate from the trope talks are separate from the history videos are separate from the history makers videos so basically just adding like a new category of like this is some stuff that might show up on this channel sometimes done by this other guy um uh, <laughs> it just uh <laughs> It, it worked. It worked in my head, and uh, it was a it was a very welcome addition to help kind of keep things running while I was like, oh God, Dante, stop describing. Sh <laughs> and just on the on the larger scale, like as you continued to have ideas and and put things on the channel, it was like, yeah, this is really working, and I'm very glad because now this isn't just me and like can I keep this going? Like, can I keep this up even though I'm stressed and tired and it's college? It's like, no, now there's more than one person working on this. Now there's the possibility, a whole greater than the sum of its parts. It's easier to manage something when it's not essentially two people in isolation. It's two people working together. Exactly, and I'll get to that in a second. The one thing I do want to mention, though, is that yes. I find it so funny that from even such an early point, from the very first video, the thumbnail was Dragon Bones font at like a 30 <laughs> degree angle, and we have not changed that since, and I dare say we never will. No, why would we do that? I like it when things are consistent. <laughs> We've just established it works. this. works. <laughs> we had green text for the history videos, which is why the history videos still have green text <laughs> in the thumbnails, yeah. despite the fact that I was later canonized as blue. But uh, yes, right, to exactly your point, uh, year four, 2016 was the year of making constraints into our strengths. We couldn't film anything in camera because we were in college and we didn't have a good backdrop. Mm. We didn't have consistent filming times or let alone gear, good lord. God, gear. No. And we were working in completely separate time zones, several states away. We could not work together on videos because of, of physical and technical limitations. So we went all in on animation and developing parallel workflows, exactly what you were just saying, of mm. like how we took what was very significant constraints in our ability to make content and basically saying, okay, let's let's cordon ourselves off. Let's have our own video pipelines where we have our own research topics, video tones, visual styles, and production schedules. Yet, as a team, we can collaborate on scripts, check each other's work, and build a overall content strategy together so we have the benefits of a solo project where no one's bothering us and we're not waiting on anyone to get stuff done, yeah. like, you know, a classic group project. Ugh. But we also have consistent support and steady teamwork. So that just fact of life of how we were in college at the time informed everything else uh, about the structure of how this channel works. Yeah, and it, it worked out really well because I've always had a much easier time making progress on a project when I can show off bits of it to other people like while I'm working on it. So I'd like harangue members of my family and be like, hey, check it out, this funny thing I drew, and that's whatever. But like having an actual channel partner where I could be like, hey, here's the script I have. It's like, oh, I love this joke. It's like, yes, yes, validation. <laughs> and 
that releases the happy brain chemicals that make it easier exactly. to make the rest of the project happen. Because as mentioned, you know, the, the, the process of a long form artistic creation is like kind of peaks and valleys of like, this part's really fun, and then I have to draw 200 frames of boats, and this part's <laughs> fun again, but now I have to draw Dante's in hell. Okay, you know, like, yeah. like good stuff happens, and the good stuff keeps you going through the tedious stuff, and keeping that pace is the number one, like, very important thing to not burn out. And considering, like, at this point, we've been at this for a decade, and I, at least, I don't think I've ever experienced full burnout. I think we've hit a rhythm that works pretty well. Like, we've had rough yeah. weeks or months. Uh, and we'll like, get there. Well, it's later in the presentation. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, like, I, from what I've heard other artists describe full burnout as, like, I, I never pushed myself into that, and I, I consider that good. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Um, yeah. Things like this also determined our upload schedule. So when yeah. we had gotten better at making videos faster for various reasons of, of skill and being able to more accurately ply things off of what I was learning in class and kind of <laughs> turning those into videos, yay. Um, <laughs> there was a distinct gap in quality between the videos that I was working off of classwork from and the videos that I was going in blind. Mm. Uh, and among the early ones, you can really tell. <laughs> um, but it helped us set a rhythm that we felt very comfortable with where it's like okay there's there's two of us working together we can make videos at a rate of approximately once every two weeks you know assuming things are solid so by like you know junior year or so we got into a very comfortable one upload a week but each of us is only doing two videos a month mm -hmm. which is way easier to maintain than you know one video a week which is really really hard and we've talked to solo creators and people who have teams and stuff it's like yeah doing all of this work once a week is really really taxing but because of the way we've set this up where we have it's one week on one week off it's so much easier to be able to take the time and really invest in making a video as good as we can within the span of those two weeks yeah and then we fire it off and then we have the deadline of like look we can't we can't agonize over this forever it's got to get done but we still have a lot of, of leeway and flexibility in that so it it worked so elegantly yeah. and so well <laughs> by a sheer stroke of coincidence yeah and this was also around the time, like, YouTube had existed for a while at this point. We were sort of, as the channel was growing, you know, slowly but surely, we were sort of paying more attention to how other creators actually, like, ran things. Because, you know, when you're just like, this is a fun video, I'm going to watch it. Like, that's great. But we were, like, paying attention to, like, how frequently do they upload of those uploads? How many of those yeah. are videos that I actually want to watch? There were channels we followed that put out, like, multiple videos a day. And we were like, eh, maybe, like, one of these a week I'll, I'll, I'll actually like. <laughs> we were starting to pay yeah. more attention, learning more from our, our peers at this point. Although I don't think either of us were thinking about it that way. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> we were just still <laughs> around. I think we were still sub 1,000 or no. Like, at this point, I think we were creeping up on like maybe 5k because i remember we did our very first like maybe there's merch now video uh yeah somewhere um along so we hit 1000 subscribers in the summer of 2015 ah. i was in padova when it happened huh. we hit 3000 subscribers in december of 2015 i actually one of my friends was the 3000th subscriber <laughs> which was wild and then we had about 10,000 subscribers the following summer in 2016. Mm. i think for a while, we were just kind of like, it's amazing that anybody watches these. And then we sort of got used to that. But then every time we hit a new big number, we were like, that's a <laughs> lot of people. <laughs> What's happening? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was more of an audience than I had ever expected on any of my art. As mentioned, I'd had a little bit of angst about that. Like, you know, I'd, oh, I have all these ideas, but I don't know if anyone will ever see them. Will anybody ever truly know I lived? And then we were getting to the point where we're like, well, 10,000 people will. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> uh, like, yeah. somewhere along the line, we just hit the point where my brain stopped stressing about that. It was like, well, I mean, we did that. People, like, we've, we've affected people <laughs> somehow. Yeah. The yeah. butterfly has flapped its wings, <laughs> and you're going to have a <laughs> ripple effect for at least a few centuries. I was like, whoa, yeah, okay. No, seriously. God. Yeah, think of it that way. It's like, yikes. Mm. So continuing with the numbers, about 10,000 subscribers in the summer of 2016, and then into spring of 2017, we had just over 20, like 23,000 subscribers around the start of final season in 2017. <laughs> And we come to the question of whether it's better to be lucky than good, because <laughs> in 2017, 
um, one of our videos hit it really big. So Machiavelli and the Prince says that no amount of skill can beat sheer dumb luck. So if you had to choose, you would rather be lucky than be good. Of course you worked Machiavelli into this. How could I not? <laughs> On YouTube, though, this isn't the case because plenty of extremely talented creators and a lot of crappy ones to go viral and fizzle out either slowly or sometimes pretty much immediately, whereas this huge blip on like, oh, this video gets millions of views and then everyone leaves and it's like, okay, bye. Mm. So why is it that that happens sometimes and not other times? And specifically, why is that not what happens to us mm. when the Eros and Psyche video popped the f*** off oh, in spring of 2017, where we had, I want to say like hundreds of thousands and even like low millions of views on that video, which was by far the most popular one we'd ever had at that point. Yeah, honestly, I was really happy about this one. This like, I've ha I'd had fun working on other videos, but a lot of it was very, very taxing because it was just like, I was new to digital art. I was new to the chibi art style and you can really <laughs> tell in the Iliad. You can tell the heads get smaller over time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was because I'd been reading all those Hi, I'm Daisy Metal Gear comics and I was just like, I love this style. I don't understand it, but I want to. But Eros and Psyche was like, I'd known this myth for years. We had a picture book version in my house. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was beautiful and, and sweet. I didn't need to do a ton of research into it. I we covered the copy of it in one of my other Greek thought and lit classes. <laughs> and so we just had it and I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to actually like this. I'm going to really just enjoy drawing every part of this because it's fun and cute and a lot of fun stuff happens. And the visuals are interesting and the characters are appealingly designed. That ending song was actually like one of the somewhere along the line I'd, I'd switch to recording the ending songs and that was a huge hurdle on my end because <laughs> um, it turns out getting used to your spoken vi voice on uh, recording is not the same thing as getting used to your singing voice on recording which I'm still not no. used to I still don't like it <laughs> but uh, the, the ending song for Eros and Psyche is uh, 10 minutes ago but it was just so fun it was perfectly in my range I had a great I think the singer is a tenor which lines up pretty well and I yep, just had a, it. like I, I think I listened to it again semi-recently and I was like wait this is like That's like an sweet. actually decent performance <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of that contributed. Like, it was a fairly short video. It was covering a sweet subject. There was, like, visible love poured into some of the art there because I wasn't oh, so yeah. tired that it was just, like, functional art showing what was happening. I mean, I think that is definitely the most beautiful video you had drawn up until that point. Uh, yeah. By, that, by a stretch. <laughs> for sure, yeah. At that point, definitely. Uh, and I think this is this is one of the just benefits of getting better at art, which is that as you get better, you get faster and you get more efficient, which means you have more energy to spare on everything else. Like yeah. the, the amount of slog you have to get through to get through any art project diminishes as you get more skilled. Dante's Inferno, that took me months and months. There were hundreds of frames in there. I was so tired. And you can kind of tell in some places, it's like, that's that, that's not a background. That's like a gradient with some lines on it. Yeah, okay, fine. But the more energy I had, the more I could put into the art, the better the videos got. And I got there by hitting the 80% rule on the other videos, being like, it's done, yep. I can rest now for like two weeks. Yeah. So Eros and Psyche was like genuinely, I think probably my best video up to that point. So I'm, I'm glad that that's the one that kind of the algorithm bumped and then bumped again. But to your point about, you know, better to be lucky than good, like the video got big, but what kept people was the backlog. All of those videos yep. that we would put work into over the years, at this point it had been years, videos that didn't get that many views, but that were decent quality, that had good stuff, that were all within a space of, if you come to this channel, you basically know what to expect. We weren't doing kind of a variety channel where every other video would be something different. If you liked one video, there were 10 more videos just like it. And they only mm. existed because we'd been making them even when they weren't getting, you know, nice views. And even when it didn't seem rewarding, we were still putting yeah. in the work and the time. Because we liked it. It was fun. We <laughs> liked it. It was fun. Like, we're having fun. We're getting better at what we're doing. We're building an online presence. If we want to do other art projects, we now have an audience that will at least check it out and see if they like it. They'll be curious. <laughs> yeah, they'll be curious. We, we now have a huge leg up on discoverability for any other projects we might want to do. And my own Machiavellian scheming of eventually making a webcomic was like <laughs> kind of going in the background like, yes, good. Yes, yes yeah, dance exactly. puppets. Yeah, so when, when this video went boing, like we saw the views on it spike, but we also saw the views on every other video on the channel go yep. up and like stay up. Yeah, what happened was everyone came into this video and then they watched another video and they watched another video and then they subscribed mm -hmm. and they watched another video and another video and then people would show up 
because of Eros and Psyche, subscribe and watch our entire back catalog, <laughs> like me, in a night. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned being in Padua uh, when we hit 3,000. I had something fun going on when this went viral, too. I was, th the night before, we were going to leave on a dinosaur dig. That's right. I was up at like 3 a.m. We just watched Land Before Time and Jurassic Park back to back because paleontologists are exactly the kind of nerds you think they are. Mm -hmm. And I was just sort of like checking the app and I was like, oh, the line's going up. That's interesting. <laughs> and then I also, because I think we had on a hunch we'd come up with a subscriber milestone video for the next subscriber milestone. And we were like, yeah, we'll probably drop this on this day. And I was like, I think we're going to hit that while I'm in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, yeah. with no internet. <laughs> I hope that's going to be okay. <laughs> I think that's the biggest spike of growth, proportionately speaking, we've ever had. Oh, ever. Because <laughs> this was the, like, this was the Cambrian explosion in terms of our yeah. audience. This was a mm -hmm. small population going to a large, like a significant population over like a month. And then it sort of, it sort of leveled out, you know? The, the change stopped being quite so ridiculous. It, it, it slowed yeah. down into a more steady pace, but it didn't flatten to zero, you know? No. The derivative was still positive. People kept showing up. People kept and showing up. And that's the up. thing is, like, every time someone would show up to the channel, they would, you know, whatever video drew them in would draw them in, they'd subscribe, and then they would watch through the entire rest of the back catalog. To this day, I want everybody in the in the audience to to imagine how much of our, our YouTube AdSense revenue comes from the videos we post in that month and how much comes from our back catalog. You're wrong. 25% <laughs> of our YouTube revenue comes from the videos we posted that month. And to this day, 75% of our YouTube revenue, of our watch time, comes from our back catalog, whether it's people who subscribed or people who are like, you know, I've been a subscriber from OSP for a while. Let me just go back and watch a few of the old ones. That Our yeah. back catalog is still so strong. And in the early days of a channel, it's hard to justify the, the effort on, you know, like really like putting in the whole college try into the videos. But those videos, even if they don't get a lot of eyes on them now, they are your lifeblood for the entire rest of your career. Yeah. So even though we still follow the 80% rule, we give it a really good 80% where we always wanted to raise what that 80% is, where every video we're trying something new, we're trying something better, we're trying to improve little by little by little so that our videos would always be improving and always be worth watching. And I, I think I've said somewhere like on a podcast or something, we always try to make a video such that it will still be watchable and good in five years, yeah. at least. Yeah, like we we might not like it, but we want it to hold up. <laughs> yeah. And the funny thing is like that that, that 25-75% split, like that's that's not even accounting for the fact that like all of the Shakespeare videos and the Iliad video are demonetized for copyright stuff. <laughs> I mean, all the Shakespeare videos used movie footage. Like obviously they were going to get got. I think the Iliad got grabbed for like one soundtrack I used and I just, yep. like, there's no point in going back and changing it. Like a re-upload <laughs> re of a video that's like eight years old. Yeah, that'll fly. Yeah. Oh man, it's... <laughs> What I love yeah. about this whole thing is that, like, you went straight to Machiavelli when you could have just said slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> oh, God. I, I like to say we were not only lucky, but we were also good. And because we were lucky and good, we, we had this confluence of factors that led us to having this huge growth right around the time I think that we launched our Patreon. And this is about when we realized this can be, this can be a full-time job. This can be a legit actual thing yeah. and then as that happened we had to consider okay <laughs> what are our motivations on this because it's easy to I, I won't necessarily say sell out but it's easy to make videos that are maybe simpler little little easier to make little cheaper to make take less time you can pump them out faster mm. load them up with ads and that's a way to do it some people do it that way but you know, we were perfectly happy to let OSP be a hobby and we were thinking like, you know, after college we might get real jobs and that's fine. But as we realized, okay, we're, we can do this as our full-time job now. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to be an amazing living. We're not going to be, you know, superstars or whatever, but like this can support a job. Yeah. Great. Perfect. That's all we need. So with that in mind, what choices did we make? as we kind of turned this into a job and had to learn for ourselves how to professionalize this because mm. I was studying economics, but that was all a bunch of like bullshit <laughs> micro theory and not actually how to run a business. So, ha. Huh. Yeah, yeah, there, there was a lot of discussion. I do remember, I think even before the 100,000 mark, we were still getting some like, 
the occasional email that would be like, hello, insert name here. We have many clicks for you if you sign here. <laughs> and we're like, mm, okay. And like, as mentioned, like I was wary about letting one of my best friends join the enterprise. How do you think I would have felt about being like, yes, faceless corporation, please gain full control over this, the, the work of my life, apparently. That, I was already very much like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna f do that. <laughs> um, that money's not worth it. But this was a time where a lot of uh, YouTube megacorps mega were basically conglomeratizing and like eating other channels. Yeah. And like we'd see channels that we follow like suddenly be part of a bigger thing. And we're like, oh, that's kind of cool. But ultimately, like you had the econ knowledge and I was just antisocial enough that like <laughs> together by our powers combined, we just didn't want to grow the channel in terms of like personnel. <laughs> personnel or like taking investment opportunities or, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Um, people are like, oh, we'll buy a such and such stake of your channel or like, mm. oh, we'll license your stuff for television. Like, <laughs> that was a weird no, one. No, thank you. don't want to do that. Because we had, you know, all kinds of crappy sponsors that we were like, okay, well, let's not do that. Yeah. Um, and we tried to set a policy very early on of like, we're only going to take sponsors for stuff that's like related to education. I took exactly one game sponsorship. Absolutely <laughs> never again. Yeah. And we, we had a very very strict policy of like, we're only going to do sponsors if they work and they make sense. You know, NordVPN had like a thing a couple years ago. We're like, hey guys, we want out of this deal. And it's like, yep, okay, we're done. You know, yeah. we, we, we walked away from, from, from fine money. Fine. fine. Um, yeah. Because it's like this, this isn't, this isn't good. This doesn't work for us. So there were several choices of like staying independent and staying, you know, like not aggressively monetizing our channel with a billion mid roll ads. Yeah that created an air of like niceness and not like emanating capitalist greed <laughs> from every fiber and every second of our runtime. I will say there was some back end stuff, not on our end, but on YouTube's end during this, because I had been a little bit wary about monetizing the channel in the first place, just because I was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to corrupt the artistic purity of that. For the record, feel free to corrupt away. If you're not getting paid for your <laughs> art and you can't like feed yourself, like a starving artist can only produce art until they starve. So, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> you good. I think I timed that poorly. <laughs> I saw the teacup too late. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sometime, I want to say maybe within the year after we sort of hit the little button and monetized, uh, YouTube basically announced that they were just going to put ads on every video anyway, regardless of whether the channel was monetized. The only difference was whether the user was going to get any of that. And I was like, I feel less bad about this now. <laughs> I no longer feel like I'm subjecting our viewers to ads because they'd be getting them anyway. A lot of channels, you know, people take more sponsorships than we do and that's completely fine. This was a matter of it's personal fine. comfort and what we could afford to, you know, what what principles we could afford to adhere to and what we were like, ah, this is actually fine. Also for, for other channels, some people have videos that are significantly more expensive to make. Yeah. If you're shooting with entire crews, if you have props, if you have sets, if you're dealing with like cameras and stuff like that, like those are expensive videos. But yeah, take a sponsor, dude, it's fine. So we're not trying to demonize sponsors. No. It was just, it was so antithetical to what we wanted to do with the channel where it's like, look, we're not starving. We don't need to do this. The second it became onerous, we're like, nah, Yeah, uh -uh. exactly. And we later realized that we can substitute sponsor money with pin money. We'll pin get there. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. wow, this is actually a nice thing for the audience. And this, you know, like deepens, you know, our collective investment in these characters and these stories. Yeah. Let's do that instead of talking about a VPN. <laughs> And all of the, the, you know, the channel networks where it's like, we'll get you sponsors, we'll make you money is like, okay, they own your channel, they can dictate your schedule, and they'll get you sponsor money. It's like, I don't, I don't actually want any of those three things. No, yeah. And then seeing Defy Media completely collapse, a lot of innocent channels got completely caught up in horrible financial decisions from a much larger company with no accountability to their creators. It's, we were like, no, absolutely not. We're, we're so fiercely independent. So as we were now, you know, thinking, okay, we made the right decision. We had to contend with the possibility of going a little bit overboard mm. in, in one or various directions, because now that OSP was full time, we, we felt some, some pressure internal, some pressure external to sort of upgrade and signify that we'd made it into the big leagues of YouTube. And this took, for me at least, I can't speak to, to oh. your experience, Red, but this was friends and family members telling me that we needed to hire 
editors, animators, researchers, writers, managers, salespeople, plural, <laughs> where it's like hire out everything so you'll still get paid, but you'll just manage it. You won't have to do it. It's like, yeah, so I'm going to have to <laughs> keep track of a bunch of people and then I don't even get to make the art. What the f*** is wrong with you? No. That's so interesting. It's like... If you enjoyed managing people and didn't actually enjoy what you were doing for a living, that would make sense. But you don't like managing people and you do like what you do for a living. So that would be hell. I didn't have friends or family. I think I had a couple people be like, have you ever considered hiring another animator? And I was like, no. And that was as far as that went. Uh, I think because like my immediate family members are all artists. So they kind of know what's up and they like enjoy making art and they understand enjoying making art. And everyone in my family who's more like business minded doesn't really understand what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but then you get the point where you you kind of explain how the YouTube thing works, and then you see the dollar sign in their eyes, like, <laughs> oh wait, here's how you can monetize this. It's like I know yeah. I don't want to. We're doing this, <laughs> and we've been able to do it so sustainably because we enjoy basically every part of what we're doing. If we mess up that delicately balanced ecosystem, there's no guarantee <laughs> it will stay sustainable. Like we would take the occasional leap you know we'd try new things we'd add new series to the channel mm -hmm. and you know it'd be like okay i hope that our audience has at least a sub audience that will like what we're doing here but we don't really know but it, at minimum we are enjoying this like we're adding new videos because we really really want to like when yeah. i uh when i added trope talks to the channel i don't remember what year that was i'm sure it's in here somewhere i i was like i really hope people like this because i mean i'm gonna make this anyway like i already <laughs> like I, I never stop talking about this stuff with my friends. Having an outlet for it that isn't them might be like... 2016. 2016. Wow, wow that's earlier yeah. than I expected. It, yeah, same. <laughs> yeah. But like every time you start something like that, it's, there's a risk. You know, you don't know if your existing audience is going to overlap with the audience for this thing. For me, at least, I was like, I... I gotta get this out of my head <laughs> or it's just gonna stay there and make me insufferable in conversations with yep. my friends. And because we kept it in the zone of things we enjoyed, things we liked doing, like there would be slogs in the process, but overall it was something we enjoyed that we felt was worthwhile, that we loved seeing the audience feedback about because that also helped us keep it going. Uh, even when we were maybe having a tough time, it's like, oh man, but they're really gonna love this, aren't they? That kind of made it an incredibly easy decision to not essentially throw that away or, or outsource it to other people and just rake in the cash. Because, like, obviously, like, having money was nice and helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, like, it was good that that was a thing that was happening. But it wasn't the point. The point was the the videos that we were putting out, you know? We were trying to make them as good as we could without driving ourselves nuts. And I understand the logic of like, oh, well now you can just hire out all the parts of it you don't like doing. And it's like, that there is no part of this I don't like doing. There's yeah. no part of this that we could actually easily outsource without losing a fundamental part of the process that we enjoy. And we yeah. also don't care that much about making fat stacks of cash for doing nothing, <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the closest we got was was when um, Indigo came on the channel as an editor. That was kind of mm. like a, a work-study type project uh, that ended up... It, it was fun and it was a good time, but I think the testament to the success of Indigo coming on the channel was when we had her pivot to managing the podcast, yeah. which was an excellent addition to what we do and is cool because... It doesn't need to be monetized. Yeah. You know, it, it could be, but it doesn't make money. It doesn't get YouTube ads. It's just, it's a thing for the audience to enjoy. And it the benefit was it takes two hours of our time to record it. And then Indigo assembles it and puts it up on all the different podcast platforms. And that's great. So we still have our own production of everything that we do. Yeah. And the thing that we don't necessarily have strong feelings about, you know, <laughs> podcast production, it's like, okay, well, that we can say, okay, let's let Indigo take care of that because she understands that. And she has, podcasting is in her bones. <laughs> but even that was like, this is a, a simple part of the channel that that exists to build the community. And that was, a, that, that was a case where we didn't need to, like, we didn't change our production process to carve out bits of it and hand them off to somebody else, we added something that we wouldn't have done yeah. otherwise because... <laughs> And he was mentioned this anecdote before where like, I, I don't remember what stream we were on where we just spent like 10 Sushima. minutes being like, yeah, yeah, it goes to Sushima, <laughs> where we were just like, I don't just don't get podcasts, right? Like, I mean, get a video format, like a respectable platform. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole time Indigo is listening to the stream while she's writing up the like, here's why you should let me start your podcast pro like pitch for us. <laughs> 
So, yeah. like, we, I mean, we wouldn't have done it uh, if she hadn't suggested it. And it worked out great. And we're having a good time yeah. with it. But, like, that's the benefit of when you put down the roots, when you build the strong foundations, when you have a really solid, sustainable workflow, you don't want to knock out bits of it like as a Jenga tower and be like, uh, you, <laughs> I'll pay you to do this yeah. and then I'll get more money. It's more like, hey, what if we had a second Jenga tower? <laughs> so, yeah. anyway. Second little smaller Jenga tower, audio only, you can't see it. Don't talk to me or my son ever again. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of, of times where we could have done something in the realm of side projects. Like we, we got offers for books. We've had mm. people be like, have you considered a board game? It's like, well... And we thought about it, and a lot of them, it's like, this doesn't make sense. No, sorry, yeah. we never forced anything. We we always made sure if we did something extra, it's like, does this make sense for our channel? It's not just, is this cool, but does it make sense for us? And for a lot of people, they do cool things, and it works fantastically. Yeah. But we always wanted to be careful, since it was just us, and we wanted to keep it that way. <laughs> like, what can we do that actually makes sense? Getting it to the 80% rule, so then it's done, is one thing. But, like, you want the base idea you're working off of to be something you believe in and that you think is worth making. And I think that was a big part of it because like you take a side joke and you spawn it off into a huge thing like that thing better be good. That, that thing yeah. better hold up <laughs> on its own and it better be like solid right down to its bones. We didn't want to shoot for the moon and then like crash in a cornfield somewhere. We wanted everything we did to be like planned out solidly from the beginning and done to the best of our ability at the time. And that's a hard thing to do if you're outsourcing to other people, you know? And it's it served us really well, you know? Like, not everything we've done has been, like, 100% fantastic. No, a lot of the no, stuff that, stinkers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of the stuff I've done, uh, I think, has aged poorly. I'm not going to, like, scrap it because I that, that's a rabbit hole I will not be able to resist going down if I start. But, uh, you know, there, there's, there's things, there's decisions I made that I wouldn't do now. There's things that I think are mistakes. But I always started from, I want to make this happen, and I will find a way to keep that enthusiasm through the whole thing. It is remarkable how simple things can be when your motivations are simple, which in mm. our case was make good ass art. Yeah, just trying to get better and make better <laughs> art. <laughs> so sometimes everything is going super well and then wrenches out of left field from, from IRL come to, to whack you in the face. <laughs> That's a mixed wrenches. metaphor and a half. Wrenches yeah. out of left field. <laughs> Yeah, you ever play with a really dodgy baseball team? It's like the, the Toon Squad is like, they, they start doing crime on the basketball court. They throw wrenches at you in the middle of baseball. I would I knew exactly where I was going with that metaphor, and <laughs> I will not take any criticism. I would certainly not expect a wrench out of left field, so I guess the metaphor works great. Exactly. So, what is the role of entertainment media in a global crisis? Good f***ing question. Because in 2020, the pandemic happened, and everyone had to basically turn their entire lives up upside down to deal with the everything. So in 2020, we kind of felt the greater purpose kind of shifted a little bit because of course we were still just making jokes. We weren't saving the world here, mm. but we were for a non-zero amount of people, a source of easy comedy, a source of how to learn when schools were closed. And it was really hard for a lot of people to focus in Zoom classes because Zoom class is awful. Mm. And a way to, in many instances over the course of several charity streams that year and in years following, yeah. raise substantial amounts of money for real causes in the world for COVID relief, disaster relief, youth arts charities, LGBT charities, and the war effort in Ukraine and the support of civilians in Ukraine yeah. in this year to raise what ended up being over $225,000, including $50,000 from OSP ourselves over oh, donations yeah. that we had made over various, you know, we didn't make that all at once, no. over various <laughs> streams and things where we, at, at, at least 50,000, I, I couldn't get a, a full number because I, I forgot. Right, yeah. Um, but <laughs> over here on the on the right side, you can see all of our YouTube giving fundraisers. There's about $50,000 of Tiltify fundraisers for Feeding America and stuff that I just, I didn't show here. Mm. But I mean, you can see them all. It's a lot. And yeah. we started really getting into like, we can use our platform to just, raise money for charity stuff and it worked really really well <laughs> and yeah because for context we'd hit a million subscribers before this like i don't remember which year specifically but it, it was, was 2019 2019, it was 2019. Yeah, yeah so like the year before this we we'd reached a million we were like this is this is like the milestone you know this was the bucket list this was the unprecedented level of success that none of us could have ever predicted when we were just dicking around in our respective college dorms having a grand yeah. old time the the sort of <laughs> 
<laughs> the little milestone video we made for that was like 100% facetious. Like we must be fancy that was now. So funny. But the, sort of like the <laughs> message at the end of like, let's not try that again. <laughs> let's just stick with yeah. like what we're good at and what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just have a good time. Was like that was a very genuine kind of like we'd had the discussion of like should we like completely change the game? We're like no, no. We got here by doing what works. We're gonna keep doing what works. Yeah. But I remember. Like, we have had, at times, we've had, like, the little, like, you know, lock eyes, single brain cell, we need to say something, right? Uh, yeah. In fact, I remember, not in 2020, four years earlier, when the channel was still very small, yeah. we both did something like that after the, the election. In fact, I think I did mine at 3 a.m. the night of the election. <laughs> that was an interesting experience, because I remember feeling so scared, uh, because yeah. the the channel was quite young, you had joined, but you had joined semi-recently, and there had been a few users rattling around who I could just, like, smell it on their comments that they were yeah. <laughs> they were kind of yeah. dicks. I sort of reached a little mental crossroads that night in the midst of the stress and the, the oh shit. And I had this sort of, like, I can either make it very clear where I stand and piss off those people of my very small audience <laughs> <laughs> or I can, I can kind of hang back. I can play it close to the chest. I can stay visibly apolitical if I, you know, and just build up the audience that I already have. And then I was like, Fuck it. you know, I had this sudden <laughs> little burst of pure rage just motivating me. That burst of pure rage is very valuable, by the way. If you have one of those, keep it very useful. And I just kind of, I'm going to record a little little guitar thing to make it extremely clear where I stand on this and then I'm going to go the f to sleep. We coordinated where you were going to do the, the the guitar medley and I was going to do the, uh, what was it? It was the it, Rome, Rome Survived, survived Nero, yeah. Nero, that was... which maybe was not my, my best constructed argument, but we the sentiment, I mean, for the first time that we had tried something like that, responding to a moment, yeah. the fact that that was our reflex, I think, was telling and then seeing again in 2020 where it's like, look, gang, it's messed up. What are we going to do about it? Yeah. It was a formative moment that would then echo in the pandemic where we're like, okay, we can just kind of sit here or yeah. we can use our platform in a way that's like, look, here's the deal. Wear your masks, take care of yourself, take care of your family. But also if you have a couple dollars to spend, give to a charity. If you have your time that you can donate, yeah. help out volunteer. If you just want to learn about the issues of, again, in 2020, systemic racism and <laughs> violence and policing inherent against the black community, Whew. learn about that stuff. And yeah. we were trying to be like, okay, what can we do? And using our platform in that way was sort of a like, filling the boots that we had kind of given ourselves four <laughs> years earlier. If we can make people laugh, if we can make people forget their troubles for a second, if we can help people be focused enough to act with intention in their lives and support the people in their lives who need it to maybe like learn a thing or two about violence and racism and policing and then to get up and vote in the election that year, mm. that makes a difference. And we felt like, holy crap, we're actually doing something. Yeah, I wanted to, again, you know, in contrast, like in 2016, that one really sh night, I didn't think that video was gonna do anything. And practically speaking, I don't think it really did much except be like, hey bud, I'm feeling it too. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I felt powerless, you know? I, I think a lot of people did that night. Uh, and just in general, you know? Like, yeah. uh, a lot of the a lot of the trouble people have getting out to vote is like being like, I am one person among so many people, it can't possibly matter. And it's like, it does matter. That's the problem. It matters just enough that you, you really should. But feeling that small and that unimportant, you know, given it, your, given it the old college try and it didn't matter, and it's just like, what can I do? I, I, you know, the channel was tiny yeah. in 2016. We couldn't do anything from that perspective. But in 2020, we could. I think that when you are a creator and you're faced with something that feels cataclysmic, it can feel like your only option is to drop the creator attitude and get really real and vulnerable. And I think in 2016, I was just feeling very raw and unhappy and like, I still, you know, tried to turn that into something. I was like, I'm just gonna sing. You know what? Singing has always solved historical cultural problems. It's not gonna do anything, but at least I'll still be singing. At least I'll be, I'll be drawing a line in the sand in, the, in this little baby <laughs> YouTube channel and telling yeah. some of these people that they're not welcome here. Yeah. And then in 2020, when we were coming at this from a like a more established, like we know what we're doing better. We know what we're capable of a little better because we'd done the occasional charity stream before that. We'd streamed just enough to like know the mechanics. A couple times, yeah. We were like, you know what? Fuck it. We're like 
We're, we're, we're cool. We're post-time skip <laughs> redesigned. We know what the fuck <laughs> we're doing this time. <laughs> it, and fuck you. Yeah. We're going to talk about Black Lives Matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, and it was... It was good, and it, it wasn't good because it felt good. It was good because it had a tangible, like, impact, you know? Yeah. Every time we ran a fundraiser for something that was, like, a good cause, we were like, that's money that wouldn't have shifted that way otherwise, most likely. Like, that's something yep. that we can actually do. There's also something to be said about curating an audience where, you know, if you want to try to, to make the absolute biggest tent possible and get everybody to, to watch your stuff and like you, even if they might, you know, have leanings that are antithetical to valuing, you know, our worth as people, Ugh. oops, <laughs> um, you know, there, there comes a point where we, I think in 2016, we decided, you know what? We're not playing this game. Yeah. If you don't like the fact that we would like, you know, for for people who aren't straight, white, cis, and men to exist and have rights, get out. Yeah. Being, a, <laughs> being a, a queer Jewish woman already filtered out a lot of those guys early on. But, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, very early years, I wasn't open about two out of three of those things. And I, I still got, yeah. like, like, goobers in the comments being like, oh, this woman has opinions. How... Absurd. Yeah. So I don't know where the f people in 1850 got internet connections, but like, <laughs> didn't really want their AdSense anyway. It wouldn't adjust for inflation. Yeah. A lot of my earlier videos adopted very defensive tones mm -hmm. because I was working against this current of like, I'm going to be assuming there are a lot of chuds in the comments coming to disassemble <laughs> why like Muslims should actually be treated like people. Okay, I've got to argue defensively like, no, no, no I don't. <laughs> I can take human dignity as a given. <laughs> and if someone is disagreeing with that, I'm not arguing with them. Exactly. They're shouting into the void. <laughs> and that's part of what I mean when I say like we had learned between 2016 and 2020 different ways to reframe our arguments because like if you get in front of a camera to be open and vulnerable oftentimes that also means you're going to be defensive and you're not going to be making well-argued arguments you know because you're just going to be open and vulnerable it's like you are never under any obligation to be open and vulnerable with the entire internet you know you can just be like hey i'm an artist i make arguments for a living here's an argument about a possible perspective you could have on what's currently going on in the world like and we gotten a lot better at that because if you go into one of those situations being like, oh, I, I can just feel, I can feel the comments already yelling at me about this. I must, I must fight them off. It's like, no, because then the audience you're curating is going to want to fight you. <laughs> if yeah. you kind of assume that you're going to be operating in with an audience that's working on good faith, if you're like, okay, we're going to start from the premise that people are human beings with human rights and dignity, and then we're going to discuss what's going on, then they need to do a lot more work to get to where you're at to even start yelling. Yeah. And that's something we learned over the past four years that we didn't know before that because we hadn't really dealt with it that much. By, by 2020, we had the ability with our platform educationally and financially and activism to stick up for people who were not us. Yeah. We were able to be like, look gang, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. It's important that these people who might not be like you, who might have different backgrounds from you are still in your mind and are valued and understood more than they might have been before. And being able to, to go and be like, think about the people who are immunocompromised. Think about the people who suffer from racist policing. Yeah. And being able to use our platform to turn that into awareness and funds and actual things being done was such a moment and, and a year transforming my sense of our ability and our purpose in doing what we do. I think we could probably talk around this this yeah. idea forever, but... <laughs> it was a big, complicated year. We yeah. have a lot of feelings about it. <laughs> it, it was a very uh, compelling year for, for, I think, for our motivation to do more. What can we enact in the world? What change can we actually make from our platform? It was a lot more than zero. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, with that said... <laughs> What's the role of a creator's well-being in a career <laughs> predicated on constant uploads and an ever-increasing bar of quality to surpass after a year spent in a global crisis, mm. but then actually it's still a global crisis? Whoopsie. Most people haven't had to think about that before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of the creators that we, we follow, that we're friends with throughout 2020, they all started burning out, like, by the end of the year. January 2021 was so quiet online. It was a bloodbath. <laughs> we didn't have that happen. And I think part of that was because we'd already been managing our own pacing and our own schedules for years. We, we'd sort of worked out the kinks in that process without even really noticing we were doing it. Especially, like, we'd, we'd graduated two years before the pandemic. Uh, so we'd had a couple years to sort of get get our feet under us, you know, sort of figure out how to how to run the channel 
without also doing schoolwork, and we'd sort of also recovered from the rolling existential crisis that is immediately yeah. post-graduation, <laughs> especially if you're not immediately going into a more traditional job, which kind of just replaces one nice schedule with another schedule. Instead, we were like, unstructured time to work in? What? Um, but like, yeah. we'd, we'd gotten through that. We'd already just kind of managed that. And it wasn't that much of a leap from where we'd already been because like, we'd been making channel progress in between our school progress, and now we just had more time that we could fill with other stuff. But a lot of our, our peers didn't really have that exact thing going on. You know, they, they had other stuff going on. And then when the pandemic started, it cut off a lot of options for them. A lot of the things that they were doing. I mean, I was probably the one person for whom it, practically speaking, changed very little about my living situation for a while. Like, AdSense took a serious hit in April of 2020, but that was basically it. I kind of already didn't really do much outside of work. <laughs> I would just kind of <laughs> bounce between different forms of work that I liked doing. I didn't particularly like going to large outside social engagements. I would very occasionally take little vacation trips, but that was kind of it. Uh, not being able to do that, I did start to feel the, the effects from, but that took a while to sort of build up. But like, I remember you were talking about how it was difficult to manage the the pacing of work because you didn't have the option to just like go out and take a walk, hit up a coffee shop, go to the library, yeah. you know, things that you would do to reset your mind in between little batches of work. And a lot of the people who we were following, who we were friends with and just talking to about this, were basically experiencing the same problem. All the things that they would normally do to, to reset their headspace, you know, shake out the, the dust, do a little garbage collection, clean up and then get back to work, they couldn't do those things. They were just in the same space that they worked and slept and ate yeah. at all times, and they just didn't feel, you know, the world felt very, very small and limited. And nobody's mindset really thrives when they are in any sort of nope. imprisonment. <laughs> so... <laughs> We, we had to, to to make a lot of adjustments over the course of 2021, but the first one was like coming off of a big year where a lot of people were just working so hard to create more content for an audience and to do all these things and these, these whether it's fundraisers or just making more videos to to be there for the audience that really needed that that sense of like ah a person being funny things are okay. Yeah. People were burnt out at the end of the year. With all that in mind and, and this palpable danger of if we don't you know adjust we might we might be in danger of burnout. Yeah. What did we do? What did we do? The first thing was supporting each other as a team and being able to take the slack off of each other when it's like, hey, I've got a real crap month here. Yep. Can we readjust? We got creative with new video types. This was the year where we introduced the, the city minutes and the detail diatribes, yes. which ended up both being being hits in their own ways. Detail diatribe, probably one of my favorite things that we do on the channel because yeah. even though it's like, oh, this is like any other video essay, it's not. <laughs> it's way longer and it's a discussion, which you usually don't get it's one guy talking to you about a movie yeah and it helps uh what i like the most about the detailed diatribe format is that one of us plays the audience surrogate and the other one is like here's what's going on because yeah. when you're a video essayist the only difficulty is like you kind of lose sight of what your audience can be expected to know going into the subject the further into the subject you research so having someone who's completely on the outside being like i have a question what is a saying <laughs> um, it's just very <laughs> useful to have that kind of for the audience's benefit what's going on uh it makes it more of a discussion yeah just makes it easier, I think, to engage with on some level. And also, it's yeah. just really fun. Whenever we sit down for one of these, I'm like, I'm about to have a great time for two hours. Let's go, yeah. <laughs> but finally, uh, the last thing that we did was adjust how we live stream. This was the year where we started the After Darks. Red, mm. you launched these absolute hit. People <laughs> love them. A very unique type of stream that, you know, pretty much no one else on the platform does. And they're super fun every time. Um, we cut down on the game side of stuff because I was just having a really hard time having it all be on me. For some people, streaming is a very natural instinct. I just don't yeah. have that in the same way being like okay you know we can we can do the big group streams for like we have a lot of people on or we're doing a special event and like that's great those are super fun i love those but changing the way that we live stream and just taking taking that thing off our plates and it's like look here's the after darks it's just us talking it's great and and leaning into that instead has been a very important change in a much simpler and more straightforward way to create live content that works for us. Yeah, and it's it's just a fun precedent to have set. We, you know, we've done some reading streams on there now. I got through all of Dracula in the After Darks, and yeah. that was a lot of fun. And like knowing that I can do that is kind of cool because now it's like, what yeah. else can I do that with? Honestly, <laughs> this feels like the dumbest possible thing for me to just figure out. 
but a lot of these stories are so much better when you read through them out loud. So yeah, we, we did a lot of stuff in 2021. We sort of, uh, I think for 2020, we were like, we're just gonna hold the course, you know, we're, we're just gonna get through the hell yeah. ride. And then we hit January and of course, you know, the year ticked over, but tangibly speaking, very little was different. And we were like, okay, we've yeah. been holding the course and we've been doing all right, but what can we do to make this not just keeping our head barely above water. Cause I think we, yeah. we had that exact conversation a few times of like, like the, the goal is to enjoy what we're doing, not to survive what we're doing. And so we, we did yeah. some reshuffling. We, the detailed diatribe format is much faster than almost anything else we do. Cause the visuals are so yep. simple. And like the recording process is almost always the quickest part of any of our video making. The visuals always take so long. The detailed diatribes yeah. are incredibly quick for that reason. And having that option to just be like, I need this week to just, you know, breathe or do something else or like something unexpected happened and I can't finish this thing in time. It's like, that's okay. We'll hammer out one of these or we'll pull it out of the buffer and we'll be fine. And finally yeah. having that kind of safety net was a huge change because we know that if we had to take a week straight to just not actually put up any videos, you guys would be fine. Like you, you wouldn't hold it against us. You'd be okay. Yeah. But we don't want to do that. No. <laughs> we we want to keep <laughs> making things. We like putting out content. We like it when you guys react to it. We just, you know, we also want to not die in the process. <laughs> so yeah. so we, we, we take it easy when we can, but we also find ways to keep going because as mentioned, you know, if you, if you make an artist not do art, they get all sad and, 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 and antsy. I personally have a lot of difficulty putting all work down for any extended period of time, but knowing that there's yeah. no deadline hovering over it can make it a lot easier to work on with enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And this was all stuff we were sort of figuring out as we were adjusting to 2021 to the quote unquote new normal where we were like, okay, if we're in this for the long haul, how are we gonna make this work? Exactly. Yeah. And for, for me, I can't just not do work, I'll get too antsy, mm -hmm. but being able to work on something like a detailed diatribe where it's like, this is a lot simpler. I don't need to intricately research a topic to perfection and then craft like 50 <laughs> maps to, to put in the animations. I can just get on a call with Red and talk about a thing that I like. Yeah. And that's still work and it's still progress, but it is at such a lower level of intensity and stress yeah. that it is better for me than just taking a break and, you know, and, and doing nothing because I'll lose my mind if I do nothing. <laughs> so yeah. it, it is obviously great for our ability to continue working as artists, but I think it is really telling that 2021 by and large set the current shape of the videos that we make on the channel. It redefined our live stream setup. Yeah. It added a whole new catalog of, of videos. 2021 is when I branched into architecture, which is one of my favorite things to talk about now. Yeah. Even if they don't get the most play, they're just super rewarding for me to get into. And I really have been enjoying those. Yeah. 2021 was a huge year where we kind of like reorganized a lot of the stuff that we were already doing and saying like, let's 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 structure this in, in a way that makes a little more sense. And that has become what for the foreseeable future will be the the balance of of content on the channel in a really fun way yeah. and i'm really happy with how we manage that yeah and also like i think kind of critical to that is that we didn't cut off other pieces of the channel to make that happen you know we're, we're still making yeah. you know history videos history makers trope talks myths uh legends when i get around to them don't worry i'm working on it i like that we can kind of continue the way we've been doing and just pace things out a little bit differently you know yeah because that's that's just it's just fun and I like everything that we're doing and we've managed to kind of stay the course by yeah. by essentially steering by what do we like doing? What do we like doing in perpetuity and how can we make the things that aren't working work? Yeah. And it's it's been great. It's, you know, slow and steady. I think Machiavelli said that once. <laughs> Something about, yeah, being slow and steady gets the spaghetti. But also <laughs> this is another example of let your constraints become your strengths. Yeah. So we had constraints of like, we can't make these big videos this fast. Okay, work around that and make it into your strength. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we did six years later from the first time we did this, which is really telling and cool. Yeah. Next up, as we come into 2022, the 10th year of the channel, we are contending with the fact yeah. that we have a catalog stretching back 10 years and some of those videos are still absolute bangers and some of them aren't. Yeah. So how do we pay respects to the classics while 
trying to bring our overly sarcastic oeuvre, which is my favorite word because it doesn't sound like anything, <laughs> to our current standard of artistic and academic quality. <laughs> That's a tough thing to do. Yeah. yeah. I've personally gone on record to say that I basically have a, uh, a no remakes policy for my own stuff. Um, and I've, I've gone on record several, several times about the problems I have with restarting things from the <laughs> beginning. Uh, so I won't bore you with the details, but basically, if it's in the back catalog, I'm going to trust that the people who still like it are allowed to curate their own tastes, and I'm just going to continue making more better stuff. But that doesn't mean old subjects are categorically off limits. Uh, which I believe is what's coming up on that next slide, if I can see the thumbnail. Precisely. There it is. <laughs> so you have to respect the classics and bring things up to date carefully. Mm -hmm. So for Red, that is, you can explore a topic you've covered before in a different way and from a different angle. And so, you know, you've done the Iliad and the Odyssey like eight years ago. Yeah. So how do we deal with that? Well, we shuffle it up a little bit. And yeah. for, for me, uh, a lot of my, you know, old Roman history videos are some of my favorite ones, but they were all these cut up little bits of the story. And I felt like they are so much more compelling when you can put them together and see the larger arcs playing out over the course of centuries, because Rome obviously has a lot of like tiny little stories that are fun and interesting on their own, but it is a civilization that is more interesting the longer of a view you take in my opinion, mm. um, and how you can see the changes and evolutions within those details and, you know, little bit to little bit. So being able to go and do the History Resummarized series has been so rewarding to me because I can not only fix mistakes that I made, but I create a different type of viewing experience that is much more compelling than, okay, I made the same video uh, again and it starts and ends in the exact same place, but this time the visuals are slightly shinier and my performance is two years better. So in addition to that, I had a lot of videos that I'm like, you know, what these these ones just they they don't they don't hold up they're good. not yeah. they're not factually sufficient the research was well meaning but bad i've got to find something to do about those i don't want to just leave them up i don't want to delete just delete them, them or yeah. pretend like they didn't exist i don't want to remake every single one piece by piece by piece how on earth do i do this so I, in talking with you and with Adam, our friend Ludo History, yeah. came up with the concept of the Bad History Playlist. <laughs> We're taking my old work that I'm not super proud of anymore, creating a museum of my earliest work and being like, look, some of the stuff is only a little bit dodgy. Some of the stuff is like, I really goofed here. Mm. Look at this with a critical eye and learn from my mistakes, knowing that there is something wrong here. Try to figure out what it is. What about this doesn't sit right with you? How do I present this argument in a weird way? How do I like completely get a date wrong on something? Ooh. And being able to take my older work and say like, okay, I do not believe that this fits my current standard of quality. I'm not going to pretend like it didn't exist. I'm not just going to leave it up for someone to stumble onto. It's still accessible, but I'm going to reframe the experience around it so that you can still see it. If you find the jokes are funny, you can still go and laugh at them. That's fine. But recognize, like, this is not our standard. Why is it not our standard? And develop an analytical eye to being able to critically analyze other people's works so that when you do go out into the world and watch other stuff that's publicly available on YouTube, it's like, wait a minute, how are they presenting this argument? Are they being a little bit shifty with how they, they tie these two events together if they're maybe not actually that related? Uh -huh. And that was a huge relief for me yeah. to be able to be like, oh my God, I'm ab not like absolved, but like, thankfully, I am not feeling the guilt of having made these things anymore. It's like every once in a while I think about it, I'm like, oh, that's kind of embarrassing. But yeah. when it's like, if I, if I made a history video that just that gets things flat out wrong or simplifies beyond comprehension I've got to do something about that and being able to put that in a special little box and just like let it let it exist in the corner was stress relieving I think I have one video on the bad history playlist because it's just factually incorrect it's the rainbow crow story which isn't actually a Lenape folktale it, it's someone's picture book that got like cytogenesis into Anyway, it's very embarrassing for me, but at least I had a place to put it, uh, yeah. <laughs> which was good because I was like, oh, God, <laughs> it finally happened. In terms of the uh, not reworking, but like respecting the classics, uh, for me, the, the most representative example is on this slide. It's the Trojan War video that came out this year. Uh, which I had so much fun doing because again, like when I did the Iliad video, it was everything in my power to just get through the friggin' book. But now that I, I know more about research, I have an easier time getting through complicated, extremely dense literature. And I have a better sense of like, what are the 
big primary sources from ancient Greece that I can go to to like pull out bits of this very large complicated yeah. story, I could end up creating a video that essentially, if you zoomed in on like the middle 45 seconds, you'd get the entire original Iliad video. But in this case, you know, the Trojan War, that's a much bigger beast than just the Iliad. The Iliad's just the very end of it. The setup for the Trojan War, all the stuff about Helen, the stuff about how Achilles dies, none of that's in the Iliad, even though I did put it in no. the Iliad video, but ignore that. One frame. <laughs> yeah, one frame. <laughs> just making the Trojan War video was so fun. Just these little episodes of like, how did this all go to sh And it's a story that I sort of already knew because you may have guessed that my parents are nerds. Uh, the Iliad was read to me when I was quite small and the greater context was, was explained to me at the time. It was just, it kind of felt like going back through a very familiar space, but seeing it in a new light and being like, yeah, there's so much cool stuff here to talk about. There's there's punchlines galore and, and fun visuals I can really just pour my heart and soul into. And then I can get through the little Iliad speed run. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think it's mentioned in the video, but the name of the script was Trojan War Speed Run Any Percent. Uh, yep. <laughs> and the, the little 45 second bit in the middle where it's just like, here's the deal with the Iliad. And it was so refreshing it, it it's kind of like like if you're in a game and you start off really under leveled and you're like getting clobbered by goblins and giant spiders and then like you come back to the starting area when you're so much higher level and you're like Haha, you are all as ants before me uh that was kind of how i felt being able to look at the iliad and say like only the first chapter matters. <laughs> the rest of this I can summarize as a bunch of people die. That's yep. one frame, baby. It just felt yeah. so glorious. And it was fun. And it, it produced a video that I'm very proud of because I think there's value in both this and the original Iliad video and neither of them renders the other one obsolete or pointless. That's the key. That's the key. This gives you fun context for the lead up to the Trojan War. And then you watch the original and you're like, wow, her voice is so much higher. That's wild. <laughs> one of my favorite things that happened when this video came out is people doing little frame by frame side comparisons of like scenes from the Iliad video and their corresponding event in the Trojan War video of just like like Achilles killing Hector <laughs> versus like the the full poster experience flames in the background shading yeah. and lighting and I was like yeah yeah I have come a long way haven't I it was cool because there were also people being like, I can't believe she's still making that Odysseus a solid snake joke. And it's like, that joke is my baby, all right? <laughs> I'll, I'll that make, joke is the backbone of the channel. <laughs> I'll be making that joke until I'm dead in my grave. It's probably going to be on my tombstone. <laughs> well, well, lol, wouldn't it be funny if Odysseus had a headband and a growly voice? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, and it was just, it was really nice to sort of come back to sort of where it all began and then just keep moving forward after that. You know, it, it it could have been a melancholy experience, but it was just so fun and it felt worth it. Like I couldn't have made this video if I'd tried eight years ago. I, I didn't really have a moment of like, wow, I've come a long way. I was just trying to finish the video in time. But then afterwards I was like, I'm proud of this and I'm I'm proud of the first one. And I'm, I'm proud of the intervening eight years that have happened and how well they've gone. And I'm just happy about where we're at now. So that was yeah. that was nice. <laughs> and it's all because of the most devastating war in the ancient world that maybe actually happened, which is crazy. <laughs> anyway. It was really rewarding, I think, on a creative level for us to, to this past year be able to, to have these experiences where it's like, okay, you can now, you know, on, on my playlist, you can watch like Rome from founding of the city to, you know, fall of the West in, in, in 476 and, and get this is like almost like a feature length <laughs> like documentary of the whole history of Rome and just seeing this narrative put together and feeling for me like it has finally like turned into something where history is so web-like that like all the pieces eventually connect and being able to to make these big videos that like fit together and it's like here it is you can finally actually get it now in a way that you don't get just like watching the small ones through like it builds and it combines really nicely I just felt so deeply satisfied by um, and then of course covering my ass by putting the bad history because the bad <laughs> history playlist was uh, wonderful and useful to me as well the, the final one here kind of a tangential example was the the tragedy of Macbeth mm. which was obviously it was a fun little Halloween thing which was also softly done as a way to give me two extra weeks of buffer while still being good content yep. this is the strategy these are the things that we've been doing these past two years what a web we weave. it was great to have a video where we go back to something that is so structural and foundational to the channel this love of shakespeare and for the first time in like years bring it back and put it again at the forefront of osp where it's like this is where this all started from was dicking around with shakespeare's plays and being able to have like with some of the friends we've made along the way <laughs> and being able to like have this big production in this thing 
it was an overly sarcastic production title card drop. He said it, <laughs> cut to credits. Like that was, it felt like a culminating moment of like, okay, 10 years, we're, we're bringing it back. We're going back to the roots, but also doing something so much greater than what we ever could have done. Yeah. You know, even if I was there in the first year, like far beyond our abilities. So I, I felt like the tragedy of Macbeth um, Halloween production was, was a very special moment. It was, um, yeah. For us on the channel. I didn't even realize how long it's been since we had red text on the thumbnail. <laughs> Yeah, man, that was a conscious choice. It, I, I, you made the thumbnail. I hadn't even put that together until literally just now. <laughs> um, man, and it was it was so fun, and it was definitely like look at all these cool people we've met and connected with along this journey, but also like look at where we're at, where we can do this, and where we feel confident enough to do this. It wasn't something we could have done at any point before. It was a tight turnaround. It was a bigger video project than we'd ever done more on-screen filming than we'd ever done with more people than we'd ever had on one video at a time except some of the live yeah. streams and even then that was more people at once and we didn't know if it was going to work but it did when i cut together the like the highlight reel for a few days later and people were like oh this is so good now like i didn't have time to watch two and a half hours but i'll watch 26 minutes and i love it and it's like yes yes yeah Oh, we pulled it off. We made it work. We did it. And it was just very cool. Like, it, it's not the kind of thing we would have thought to make back then. Frankly, I'm still not sure how we thought of it, but uh, <laughs> it worked as, as well as it did, and it, it was just really nice. So with, with, with all that taking us up to the present moment and almost the last video we've put out, <laughs> here's a quick rundown of all of that in one slide. Yes. Every story can be told in an interesting way. Putting a project down does not mean it's gone forever. You can get valuable experience quickly by iterating. Small lateral changes amount to big evolutions. Everything on these slides is a testament to that. Um, make your constraints into your strengths. Lucky is not a substitute for good. Set your priorities and understand your motivations to avoid getting stuck yeah. later on. Don't go overboard on production value or side projects if it is outside of your means or your goals. Uh, take active steps to avoid burnout and know your limits. And pay respect to the classics, but don't get stuck in a loop. Mm -hmm. I actually think I missed a slide there. I missed the, the 2020 one. I, I, oh. That's right, I counted to 10. Um, <laughs> there should be 11 because we had a year zero. Whoops, that's Whoops. fine. And oh, also well. the 2020 stuff, which I think was the longest part of this presentation. So yeah. scroll back if, if you forgot. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> With that said, time is weird and the future is hard to predict. When we first hit 1,000 subscribers in the summer of 2015, we figured we had, you know, a maximum of three years left with the channel before we went off to college and got real jobs. Yeah. Then after we graduated and started doing OSP full time in 2018, we figured we had probably a max of five years left with the channel before the audience kind of fizzled out and we decided to be done and move on. Mm -hmm. But now with two million subscribers and coming up on the 10 year anniversary of the channel, I think there's about five more minutes before <laughs> Nemec explodes. Oh, oh, yes, this is my favorite joke, and now it's your favorite joke. <laughs> oh, so, boy. you know, we always kind of told ourselves, like, yeah, we've probably got, like, five more years, like, four more years, and we will probably be able to tell ourselves we have five more years forever. So yeah. all that to say, very sarcastically, uh, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, you're stuck with us, and you're not getting rid of us that easily. <laughs> so now that we are, are here where we are, We've got a good thing going, and we've been having way too much fun to stop. Oh, man. This is, like, literally a dream come true. <laughs> when I started this at the very beginning, I did not dare to hope that it would get even close to this successful and, and huge because, you know, you, you set yourself up for disappointment by setting your expectations that high. I was just having a good time, and that was always the most important thing was, like, you know, we could do this for an audience of nobody as long as we were having a good time. Although it is more fun when you have an audience that actually reacts to stuff. <laughs> like when I when my motivation is flagging, I go and read the comments sometimes, and I'm just like, yeah, people like this. Okay, let's go. Yeah. You know, power of friendship gives me strength as it is. I never could have assumed that we would ever get to this point. You know, a lot of it was luck. A lot of it was just hard work, and like the hard work was important so that the luck was as impactful as it was. You know. Hard work makes luck stick. Yeah. Is maybe a good way to think about yeah, it. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to put it. And just like I didn't I didn't have high expectations because I find it's easier to be pleasantly surprised if you keep low expectations. Uh <laughs> somewhere along the line that that mindset stopped feeling quite as necessary because things just kind of yeah. kept going and it's been truly incredible and absolutely none of this would have happened if you guys 
we're here watching and having a good time <laughs> and building up yeah. a community and sharing stuff around in random Discord servers that our friends are in and then mention it to us on <laughs> in passing. That's funny. Yeah. It is very funny whenever <laughs> that happens. Um, so where does this leave us and OSP? Frankly, a really, really good place. Yeah. We've learned, we've grown, we've made kick-ass videos, we've done so many pins. So many pins, we've but there will be more. We've slowly and steadily made OSP into not only a channel and a, a uh, an artistic project, but a community that we're extremely proud of and seeing what that community can do, again, back to the 2020 stuff, is, is just mind-shattering and how impressive it is. So we have awesome plans for the future of OSP, the same stuff you love, some things that will, will fit in nicely with, with everything that's been going on so far. Yeah. But we're, we're trying to, you know, taking our own advice, be responsible and strategic and only do the things that make sense for our benefit and for yours. So we want to make sure that whenever we come out with something new, that it's something that you're going to be excited about yeah. to the best of our ability. Um, not that we can predict everything, but we want to try and, and hold ourselves to the standard that we have set and that your enthusiasm <laughs> has, has raised for all of us. Yeah, so I sure. wanted to put the little pins down here as a kind of uh, a little shout out to the ways in which OSP can kind of transcend videos and become a physical thing where the pins are, you know, they're on paper, they're merch that makes money, but it is a tangible little reminder of how much people care about these stories and these characters, not even about us, about the myths and yeah. the culture that they would buy, you know, people like you would buy a little Artemis and Apollo pin <laughs> and just like tuck it on your jacket or your backpack because those characters mean something to you. Or, you know, the myths are, are a, a, a part of your enjoyment of, of world history and culture and that it, it takes a physical form in the shape of pins that will, by a significant margin, outlast the both of our lives, yeah. which is beautiful <laughs> and hilarious. The myths were here before we were and they're going to be here after we're gone <laughs> and now so are the pins, baby. <laughs> yeah, and, and that is that is just something that, that astounds me that it like our channel has taken this physical shape and the, these little shiny little trinkets mm -hmm. that, that that people carry around with them in their everyday lives, that it's a manifestation of like the enjoyment and the, the knowledge that we can bring to people through our work. And seeing that in pins is a really cool thing. This is not a plug for the fact that our pins <laughs> are on sale now, but those two things are related. So I'm not gonna say any more than that. I fully forgot that they were gonna be on sale when this video goes out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I was just like, yeah, this is about how our normal conversations about the pins go anyway. <laughs> yeah, so Aww. this all is for us to say thank you for, for 10 amazing years. You read, you, the audience, and uh, anyone who's so much as interacted with, with one of our videos or laughed at one of our jokes. <laughs> this is all for you, so, it's so all thank you. you. Baby. We've, we've had a great time, and it's all thanks to you. So, Red, uh, do you have any final thoughts before we uh, before we scoot along into working on the the next kick-ass video for this channel? <laughs> oh man, I it's wild, you know. Like, I was in a very different place when this started. Obviously, a, a lot of things have happened. Uh, two graduations, global pandemic, few other things, one wedding, but uh, that wasn't me directly. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just, the weird thing is, like, I don't feel that different, you know? Like, I'm happier, and my mental health is probably better because I'm not in school anymore. Uh, but at no <laughs> point have I ever looked back and be like, I don't recognize that person. You know, I, I remember who I was when I sat down to just, you know, tap this out in my bedroom. And uh, I remember who I was when you messaged and I made a really, really good decision <laughs> um, to, to loop you in for the foreseeable future. and. I remember who I was sitting on the cold granite floor, scrolling through the app, seeing the line go crazy the night before we, we flew out yeah. to Wyoming to dig up a friggin' sauropod. And I remember who I was when things started getting bad in 2020. And uh, I just had that little moment of like, I think this is actually gonna happen. I think I think the news is getting bad. Okay. Yeah. And then what can we do? readjusting and yeah. you know, it's it, it all feels like me and I'm just, really really lucky to have been able to make this work and to to meet so many amazing people along the way and to make so much art that i'm proud of uh and get the opportunity to make art that i didn't think i'd get to make uh and show it to an audience i wasn't sure i'd ever get i've been in this good happy place for so long that i think it's it's good to look back and be like there wasn't a guarantee that this would happen, and there was a time where I, no. th I was worried about a lot of things that I haven't had to worry about in a very long time, and it's because of this. And it's 
it's what I do for a living because I love it, and uh, the fact that I can do it for a living is all because of you guys, and I'm very, very grateful because it's super fun, and I'm having a blast, <laughs> in case you couldn't tell, in case I was too subtle. <laughs> and we will continue to do so. Hell yeah. I can share two silly anecdotes mm -hmm. um, from the earlier days of the channel. Yes. One was that day in, in Padova when we crossed over to 1,000 subscribers, and I was like, wow, this is... This is something. And then when Cyan and I came to, to Italy, we were in Padova for a day, and I was like, and that is where I was sitting the day that we crossed it. Aww. It was a very kind of fun, like, wow, you know, seeing like a little little younger me <laughs> being able to think like, wow, you know, that's and, th and that was still, to your point, that was still me. That was still me there. Yeah. And then going on my my first date with with Cyan in like basically what was the nicer dining hall on campus, <laughs> and then she was on a train home for spring break, and one of her friends was like, "Hey, check out this this video that that I found," and it was the college hell video, and she was like, "Yeah, I just went on a date with that guy." <laughs> that was like, "Wow, really showing my my best foot forward there on that one." That <laughs> is okay. Our channel was so f small. I am astounded yeah. that like the those connections got made. So it was it was remarkable and being able to go back and look at like the evolution of of your art of my maps of all the things that we've done the the subtle ways that we've slowly evolved that, that concept of kaizen continuous improvements mm. just slowly getting better every single time every with every 80% we get a little better yep. it is really remarkable so uh bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs>